Welcome to the Family Beacon Podcast from Minnesota Family Council with hosts Grace Evans and Moses Bratrude. Stay informed on the top stories on life, family, and religious freedom. Get the facts, stand for truth. Hello, and welcome back to the Family Beacon Podcast. My name is Grace Evans, and I'm here with Moses Bratrude. Today, we will be discussing uh, how some Carver County students here in Minnesota are urging the district to relocate their graduation ceremonies from a Christian church. I will also be telling you about a poll that shows that the majority of Americans believe that there are only two genders by a 31% margin. We'll also be discussing a few stories about June craziness. There's a lot of craziness happening this month. Can't tell you. (laughs) I have no idea why that would be, Grace. No idea. It's not like we've (laughs) talked about this before, but we will be updating you on that. Before we kick the podcast off, officially, though, with our very first story, I do just want to give a huge shout out to our friends over at Daily Wire who are doing great work. And just a shout out to Matt Walsh, especially because it is the one year anniversary of What is a Woman on June 1st. And really exciting news is that it has garnered over 180 million Twitter views just since the posting of the film on June 1st of this year. So that is 180 million views in just eight days. I mean, it's June 8th as we're filming. So that is incredible. It is one of the most popular documentaries of all time. One of the most watched ones, my brother told me. And recently, Elon Musk himself tweeted out, quote, every parent should watch this. And I think that just really goes to show how hungry people are for the truth and how hungry they are for apologetics against all of the gender insanity, gender um, identity agenda. So that is incredible. Just a big shout out to our friends and allies over there at Daily Wire. Without further ado, though, Moses, why don't we go ahead and jump into our first story? So in Carver County, there are some students that are protesting where their graduation was going to be held. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I had no idea that this was happening, that um, Eastern Carver County, that's a big school district in the Southwest Twin Cities metro, and they have their um, their graduation ceremony apparently at Grace Church in Eden Prairie, which I kind of thought, I, I had no idea. It seems like a bit of a random place to have a graduation ceremony. But then I did remember this is an extremely large church. True. So, um, uh, and and. I I think that the graduation ceremony has been held there for quite a while, but uh, this year Alpha News reports that students are asking the district to relocate their graduation ceremony. So I'll quote from the student uh, petition. Grace Church has a long history of making derogatory public statements against the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. Further, they do not support divorce, even in situations of domestic violence, And just to be clear, that's false. The Mm -hmm. church categorically stated that that's completely false and made up. Further, they do not support divorce. Oh, I sorry, I already read that. As a community of students and parents who represent a wide variety of marginalized identities, we mm-hmm. must change this venue. Uh, wrote a high school student in the petition. So there's a there's this quote from uh, Jefferson in the petition, um, uh, and, and it's just one of those really shoddy um, online quote generator things, um, and you can't even see all of it in the petition. But it's like erecting a wall of separation between this church and state is uh, absolutely essential to a free society. Uh, and it, like, yeah, the idea that <laughs> that using a church, uh, that a church venue uh, being the venue for this secular event is some sort of infringement mm-hmm. on people's beliefs, that it's some sort of breaking of the wall between church and Goodness. state is crazy. I mean, it's not like uh, any staff of the church are uh, praying at the graduation or preaching at the graduation or making the graduation in any way a religious ceremony. Um, so I just think this is absurd, Grace. I think, yep. and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later today because there's this, there really is a growing intolerance. I, I listened actually to a speech by Rowan Atkinson, mm. the comedian, um, and he was talking about the new intolerance, which I thought was really interesting because there's just there's just less of an ability from some people. And I, I, this is certainly true on the left. I you could probably say it's true on the right as well. There's just a, a, a lessening ability to deal with viewpoints other than your own. So like even, even entering a church, it, it makes people come out in hives apparently, you know? Yeah. I read a book this school year it was by Alistair McIntyre. I think you've read it oh, after Virtue. Oh, yeah. He talks about just how in the past, I would say 50-ish years, that 
our language really has evolved so much where we used to actually have arguments and disagreements where we would go ahead and attack the argument and have that conversation. But now we're in such a a moral, a state of moral confusion with our language that we don't actually interact with the argument. Instead, we'll, someone will say something and they'll argue something and then we won't actually interact with that. Like we'll just dismiss it and we'll start attacking their character or we'll argue against them, but they, we won't actually respond to the right. argument. Yeah, you and can so, just say, oh, well, you're just a Karen. Yeah, exactly. Or that's your white privilege talk. And you know what it really makes me think of, because you're so right that there is a growing intolerance, is 1984 with like the 10 minutes hate where you have like 10 minutes and you just rant about how terrible X or Y is. Yeah. So true. Yep. Good That's, point. Um, and by the way, that is what I say to Grace anytime she disagrees with me. I say, A, you're just a Karen. B, that's just your white privilege talking. And the amazing thing is it works every mm. time. So um, That was a beautiful testimony. <laughs> yeah. So mm. so I'm just like using the weapons of, of our adversaries. So <laughs> I think the, the backstory to this is Grace Church is a... Um, by the standards of large churches, it's pretty conservative. And um, and I love to see that. We love that they're, for example, earlier this year, they hosted the For Life Forum, which we promoted, and uh, that featured our very own Renee Carlson um, mm-hmm. uh, talking about pro-life issues, talking about shocker helping women and children. Um, and I think, how you know, dare she do how that? dare she, how, how, how dare, dare she? the church host this event? And I think for some people in this school district, uh, obviously, the church is needing to be punished for not adhering to the orthodoxy, right, of the, of our cultural moment. So the church's response uh, was, at Grace Church, we welcome conversations, clarifying our position and our heart for the community. We believe talking to each other is a better strategy than canceling one another, which gets to what Grace was saying, because it's it's like we've lost the ability to talk to each other. What Grace, what they're saying, it'd be nice to talk to each other. That's great, but is that possible? I guess that's that's my question. Is it possible to have that conversation anymore? So, relating to um, these questions of of uh, gender, especially this new poll came out, and it that you that uh, you're going to tell us about Grace. And I have to say, this is not a result that I was expecting. Yeah, me neither. I mean, okay, this is this will be pretty quick, Moses, and then we can get into the rest, some, some craziness that's happening this month. But uh, a Rasmussen poll that was actually released on June 1st of this year revealed that 71% of American adults agreed that there are, quote, two genders, male and female. And 57% of that 71% said that they strongly agreed with it. Moreover, that survey also found, Moses, that 60% of Americans support laws prohibiting gender transition procedure for minors, which we already knew that one. The survey also found, shockingly, that 67% of Democrats agree that there are only two genders. Wow. Wow. Two-thirds of Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It, just, it, it really shows you how the Democratic Party has been, uh, on this issue anyway, hijacked by a small cadre of Maoist radicals <laughs> who are trying to drag the party and also our entire country down this path of hmm. gender affirming surgeries for minors and taxpayer funding for gender transition and all of these crazy things that um, very few people have any inclination that they are actually supporting when they pull the lever for these candidates. Yeah, we have a blog post that's going live by the time you see this about how, you know, this rampant pace in Minnesota and in our country, it's not inevitable. We can stop it. And these ideologies like this idea that, oh, you can somehow be a different gender than male or female, or you can change your gender. That's actually not mainstream. It's actually led by a small minority of people that are pushing it on people because people are afraid to stand up. Yes, but it's not actually the belief of the majority of the country or even of our state. And so this article, which we'll link in the description below, talks about how Um, The majority held in the Minnesota Senate was won by only 321 votes. And it was that was only one seat, guys, a one seat majority. And so we just need to remember that even in places like Minnesota, where things seem very dark, the enemy, the opposition, whatever you want to call it, is only winning by the slimmest of margins. And that's true uh, across the country. And so when people like you and I, like Moses, like everyone listening right now speak up, that's really when hearts and minds change. That is when we can change our culture. And so just be bold. That's what I'd encourage you to do. Um, So that's an interesting poll right there. I do want to tell you about something (laughs) that's happening again at Target. Surprise, surprise. Can we say one more thing about the poll? Yeah, go ahead. I find it interesting that uh, Rasmussen, which performed this poll, 
I, I'm, I'm very confident about this issue. At the same time, I think I find it striking that these numbers have actually gone down. Mm-hmm. So Erasmussen says that the last time they ran this poll in 2021, 75% of American adults said that there were only two genders and, um, and 18% disagreed. And now we're at 71% said there were two genders and 23% disagreed. So I think that is probably an indication that um, that our opponents on this issue are having some success moving the needle with people who are sort of like fence sitters on this issue. You know, maybe they uh, have started watching some of the programming that's just really glorifying the idea of uh, kids who are transgender or adults who are transgender or whatever. And, and they are seeing that as a, they're seeing that and they're starting to believe that. Yeah. So while we're still by a three to one margin um, on the right side on this issue, I think, I think we see the need grace for better apologetics and better arguments on this issue so that we can actually reverse that and have more people coming to uh, accept that this is the truth. And I think we can. I don't think that's a that's going to keep sliding. I actually think like the what is a woman thing, that's just in the last year, as you said, 180 million views. I mean, w- that's not indicative of probably many people watched it multiple times, but like that's a huge proportion of the American mm-hmm. population. So there's a lot there's a lot to um, a lot still to move on that issue. I would say it's not surprising too that I mean when all everything that's being shoved down our kids' throats and our throats on media, all media platforms, all movies is from that agenda. It's not surprising that the needle is moving slowly but surely because I mean if you watch a movie and your favorite character in the movie has a gay best friend, then why would it be wrong for you to have a gay best friend, right? right. So I think it's just important to keep in mind that we really need to take over those cultural strongholds, cultural institutions. So we need to create Christian media, we need to create um, Christian businesses, we need to be leading in the public sphere as Christians and create a better culture. That's right. I mean, the scary thing about propaganda is that it works. Right. So when it when it when your school has mandatory Pride Month, and um, I I heard of like a secret recording of a teacher in Canada who is like um, uh, just absolutely laying into these Muslim students because they did not attend Pride related Goodness. activities. She said, "If you don't believe this, you don't belong in Canada," which I thought was like, "Whoa!" So like, religious freedom in Canada gets completely trumped by the LGBTQ um, acceptance uh, fad, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But anyway, Grace, thank you for bearing with me and and talking a little bit more about that. But what the heck is going on at Target? Yeah, so not surprisingly, whoa, Target has asked its employees to attend Pride Week events, including queer bingo and board oh, no. games. Oh, no. I, when I sent this to Moses, I, I just said, LOL. Like, <laughs> Are we even surprised at this point? No. Um, So this email was sent out to its employees, and we have a screenshot of it, and it said, show your pride. And so in addition to this queer bingo that employees can participate in, they can also listen to a presentation titled, How to Be a Better Ally from the Pride and Culture Club, or they can attend a Pride and Pro Sports panel event. No, thank you. No, thank you. (laughs) I would like women and women's sports only. No men. Uh, so yeah, that's just, um, that's going on at Target. So not surprised at all. They're just getting more and more woke. They care a lot more about their diversity points than they do about actually serving their customers. That's what we've learned from this. I mean, customers are speaking out. All of their clients are, not all, but a lot of them are rightfully upset about this, especially parents. They're making their voices heard and they care less apparently about making a profit and more about making sure that they have all of those right intersectionality points and, are seen to be quote queer allies. So it is interesting when when you have really 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 big corporations and they're doing these things and, and it's pretty clear that it's not it's not I, I maybe they make money on their pride collection. I don't know, but that what they def, it's definitely true as we saw that they lost 8 billion dollars from their stock price <laughs> after that happened and I don't think that was a coincidence um, based on uh, how that was compared with other retailers like Walmart during the same period. But I think when big corporations do this, we need to realize that it's because their own employees, not necessarily their executives, but a small cadre of, there I go again with cadre. Cadre. It's it's the small group of employees within the organization Mm -hmm. that is extremely vocal on these issues. And 
uh, and they are driving the company in the direction of being True. more activistic on social issues. Yeah. And I think we've seen that corporations this year are thinking twice about that a little bit more than they have in previous years because they're facing more public backlash. That's, of course, our hope. Um, that co- companies would just stay out of this. I, I don't think most people on either side really, well, of course, you know, everyone wants corporations to be on their side. But I think if we all had a choice and if we could say, what if corporations just stayed out of social debates and let people, uh, voters and legislators make up uh, our own minds about those things instead of all this money, I think that would probably be better. But yeah. Anyway. Well, that was an interesting story. Uh, Moses, we also want to talk a little more about the craziness that's happening this month. Um, we we already know Target's just going crazy, but something we recently saw from NPR and news was really interesting. Can you tell us about the article? Yeah. So this article, the title is Why You Might Notice More Religious Groups at Pride Celebrations This Year. Mm. Now, first of all, no, I won't because I won't be going to Pride Celebrations <laughs> this year. Uh, however, if I did, I very much believe that NPR would be right about this. So we'll read the first little bit of this article. At the Pride Fest in Santa Monica, California, six houses of worship, five churches, and a synagogue had booths lined up all in a row. The Episcopalians offered table bowling. The Lutherans offered temporary rainbow tattoos. A non-denominational church let anyone feeling lucky spin a wheel for prizes ranging from coffee mugs featuring the Lamb of God holding a rainbow flag. That (sighs) is just, like, that's... Wait, it gets worse. To a t-shirt emblazoned with Jesus wearing a rainbow crown of thorns. Blasphemy. That is, yeah, I mean, it's it's a good thing that um, God can forgive even the most gravest of sins. True. Um, because that is it's just not, you know, like, because God is so mighty and because he's given us so much, so many good things, so many blessings, chief among them, of course, the fact that we messed up, we sinned, and he saved us from that, and we honor and love him in return. And he has told us what is honoring to him and what is dishonoring to him. And when you love someone, you do what is honoring to them mm-hmm. and not what is dishonoring to them. And so th- so just First of all, first point I'll make is that this is not honoring to God. God mm-hmm. has told us what is honoring to him. This is not. So uh, the article continues, the swag at Beit Chaim Hadashim, that's a synagogue, wow, um, okay. booth was pink plastic pens and stickers that read Happy Pride Above a Rainbow Star of David. Yikes. And a Baptist minister, a quote in the article says, you don't, don't feel like you have this choice between your sexuality or your gender and your religious tradition. There are people out here who love you, who respect you, who will welcome you and will help you thrive. And are not actually Christians. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. So I really think that um, this, this like, if, if if it's true that all these mainline mm-hmm. churches and synagogues are, are participating more in pride this year, mm. I think, uh, and again, one of the seven deadly sins, I'll just remind people of that. So I yeah. think that really says something about religion in America. So true. Like how rudderless and empty and pointless uh, is so much of what goes by in the name of religion. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's just there's no longer even a semblance of believing in or caring about God's vision for sexuality. Uh, because, like, in these denominations, conservatives have all left and formed their own denominations for Methodists or Anglicans, Jews have, uh, you know, this Orthodox Jews, and then these are very much not Orthodox Jews. These would be Reformed Jews, or uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with all the denominations within Judaism. But the point being, there's no one left within these churches uh, who cares about Mm. any semblance of orthodoxy on uh, on Christ's vision for our bodies and sexuality. So it's just like, if we think about this in the broad sense, like religion is supposed to be something that takes you out of yourself and connects you vertically to God and horizontally to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And those relationships are incredibly important and they give your life meaning. Your relationship to God obviously being primary because that allows you to to repent and receive that grace that only God can give, the grace of forgiveness. But inevitably in our culture, with its emphasis on individualism and self-expression, church becomes just another avenue for the self-actualization. Yep. And so many people have observed that there's a lot of religiosity in like the LGBTQ community. Like uh, they often will go to church in numbers that are like higher than you would expect from uh, 
highly educated uh, white urban dwellers, right? And that's preponderantly the LGBTQ community in this country is highly educated white urban dwellers who generally tend not to go to church, uh, you know, in, 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 in high numbers. So there's, and I think that it has to do with how people in this community have an extremely unstable identity. And they're actually looking for an affirming community, just like the article says, they're looking for an affirming community that will reinforce this identity that they've created for themselves instead of connecting them to God or even connecting with them, with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. It's this mutual reinforcement thing where, um, where you go in and uh, the priest wearing rainbow vestments tells you that a God who you don't believe in um, offers you grace and forgives you. And in com- and uh, sort of like the exchange is that they also honor your pronouns. And you see all the other people in this congregation who are uh, who have divergent identities and you validate them and everybody just gets that validation. But there's no there's no connection to God whatsoever. It's just that's not even part of the that's not even what they claim to be offering. And so once you have that veneer of Christianity, you think you have Christianity. You think you found the pearl of great price because you feel good and you think you have the gospel. And so you're actually less likely to have ears to hear when a preacher comes and tells Mm you uh, what the true gospel says, Mm -hmm. that Jesus gives comfort to sinners, that Jesus needs you to lay down your sin, to be filled with his Holy Spirit, that statement becomes hate speech. It, it threatens the gender and the religious identity that people have built up. And that's why non-affirming churches like Grace Church that we mm-hmm. talked about earlier um, are one of the greatest threats to this narrative, the greatest threats to our cultural orthodoxy, because they actually do connect people with the true God, including people in the LGBTQ community or who are formerly in that community. They truly do connect those people with the real God who really does forgive sins for the sake of his son and who unites us with our fellow believers in real love, not the love is love, meaningless cliche statement that is everywhere during mm-hmm. the month of June. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like one of my friends on Facebook, like, I don't, I don't know if this person is religious. Actually, I think, I think he might be, but he posted this, this thing today. It said it had the, big, uh, big pride flag flowing in the wind. And it said, wishing all the homophobes and transphobes a really uncomfortable month. Yeah. (laughs) No. So uh, wishing you a really uncomfortable month if you Mm -hmm. disagree with the cultural orthodoxy on sexuality and gender. So it's really, there really is this hostility there and churches need to not run away from that. And individual Christians need to not run away from that. When we are preaching the truth, there will be people who disagree uh, and they will violently disagree. The more violently they disagree is the closer we get to poking them where it hurts, to poking them in the place where they're sensitive about, where they actually do feel the need of something bigger and better and more grace filled than what they actually have. So that's my, I'll get off the podium. Um, on that, but I think it, it's on the one level, it's extremely sad that more churches would participate in pride. On another level, it's like, what else would you expect? They've exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and these churches have, you know, they don't at this point claim they're all basically Unitarian Universalists, you know, like who don't believe in anything um, except genderless free expression. And if they tell you otherwise, they're trying, <laughs> they're trying to get you to donate to them uh, as a sort of legacy Christian organization. Oh, no, no, no. I, trust me, we really are still Methodist. No, no, you're not. You're just a secularist in a, with a rainbow flag draped around you. <laughs> wow. Okay, so done with the rant. Grace, uh, as we bring it in for landing this episode, can you tell me what you have been reading? Yeah, so I am rereading Anna Karenina, oh. such a classic. And then I'm also reading Ecclesiastes Through New Eyes, A Table in the Mist, which is oh, by yeah. Jesse Myers. Yeah. yeah. And it's, so he's a pastor and it's a commentary on Ecclesiastes. I think I've read that a million oh, years really? ago. Oh, really? I am super excited. I have only like two chapters in, but my soon to be mother in law gave it to me actually. So. Oh, well, yeah. you better pay attention. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> What's it called again? Uh, Ecclesiastes Through New Eyes, A Table in the Mist. Okay. Yep. I definitely picked that up. I'm not nice. sure if I ever actually 
finished it. What, what do you think news. of it? I like it so far. I mean, I'm not that super far into it yet, but yeah, I do like it. So, oh, I'm also wearing, <laughs> I'm also reading Queerfully and Wonderfully Made by, Le- uh, actually edited by Lee Finky. So yeah, I'm reading that. Stay tuned. We'll wow. probably talk about that on the podcast at okay. some point, but that's what I'm reading. Moses, tell me what you're reading. So I'm reading a couple books right now. The one that I have that's that's longer um, is called Revolutionary Spring, Europe Aflame, and the Fight for a New World, 1848 to 1849 um, by Sir Christopher Clark. So that's like a history of a period that Americans don't really know a ton about, which is um, the years 1848, 1849, when there was like revolutions and, and ferment in most European countries and some countries outside of Europe too, I think. Um, and, and there was like revolutions in at least France and I, and some places in Germany and Hungary and uh, possibly Spain, maybe elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but then in almost every case, those, those revolutions were like swiftly crushed. But that being said, it left a huge uh, mark on European history and European history is my sort of, um, area of, uh, area of interest when I got my master's degree. And so, um, that's been interesting. It's a little bit dry, I have to say, as you can probably imagine. So he's a um, historian. What can I say? Yeah. I mean, it's honestly, yeah, I, I, I listen to it at uh, quite a fast speed and I don't feel the need to pick up on every detail. Mm-hmm. I just really just trying to get a sense of a period of history that I don't know a ton about. So that's it guys for the family beacon, oh, except for one, news. except for one important thing which is for Grace to tell us what what's the word of God that's on your heart uh, this week for yeah. us and for our listeners. I just started reading through Isaiah. So I want to mm. read from Isaiah 1, verse starting at verse 21. And it's about the unfaithful city and then about the faithful city. And I just think it's so applicable and encouraging to us. So I will read. How the faithful city has become a whore, she who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels, a companion of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore, the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you, will smelt away your dross as with lye, and remove your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Hmm. And I just think that that is a like stunning and beautiful reminder of the hope that we have because we know that we will be called the city of righteousness. We will be called the faithful city. Um, God will bring justice and he will redeem us and the rebels and sinners will be punished by God in the end. And so just wanted to leave you guys with that note. That's so great. God wins, you know, like there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Find yourself on God's side throw yourself at his feet, ask for mercy. Like that is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And not because Christians are better people, you know, like I kind of like when people say, oh, this is so cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, the church is not a museum for the righteous. It's a hospital for the broken. And like, that's true, but we don't stay broken because God mends us. That is what he's able to do, make us a new creation through his son. And then we truly, the church truly becomes the city of righteousness Mm -hmm. that Isaiah talks about. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in and listening or watching uh, the Family Beacon podcast. We really appreciate it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to leave us a rating if you appreciate this content. And I'm going to ask that this week you think about sharing it with one, two, three, or four friends or family members who you think would benefit from it as well. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening to or watching this episode of the Family Beacon podcast from Minnesota Family Council. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you're up to date on life, family, and religious freedom. You can follow us on Instagram at MN Family Council and subscribe to us on YouTube to watch our content. Get the facts, stand for truth. Mm-hmm.